Well, good afternoon and welcome here in London to a very interesting FS Club webinar on crypto scams and what you can do about them. And uh, today our guest is Sam Roberts, who's a partner and litigator uh, with Cook, Young and Caden, uh, which I will call CYK from here on in, if, I don't, if you don't mind. Um, Sam is a noted expert in the field and you've seen his biography uh, and we'll get straight into it. So uh, you'll also know me, I'm Michael Minelli, I'm one of the directors of Zen, and it really is a privilege to be able to introduce so many of these webinars, which range widely and freely across technology, economics and finance. And what better uh, to combine all three than the very trendy cryptocurrency world uh, which certainly combines a supposedly novel technology, although many of you may recall we did a study uh, last year uh, which pointed out that all of the components were well over a quarter of a century old. Uh, secondly, uh, it combines certainly the economics of people thinking they're going to make money and finance. Uh, but wherever uh, technology, economics and finance come together, and as we were chatting in the green room, there is fraud, there are scams. Uh, people are definitely after finding easy ways to acquire uh, items of value and cryptocurrency is no different. Uh, today's agenda is going to follow a format uh, familiar to many of you. Uh, my job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible so you can hear from our expert Sam and he's got some very interesting facts, figures and uh, some good detail on how these scams work but more importantly yeah fine what can I do if I'm at the receiving end of it. Uh, we will be having 20 minutes uh, for Q&A um, if you need to say uh, that this is a question on behalf of a friend, that's fine. Sam and I understand that it wasn't you who lost your wallet. Uh, so that's fine. Please ask as many uh, questions as you have, comments, uh, share some stories in the GoToWebinar question facility. All of your questions uh, are there with uh, your email attached and they will be sent to Sam afterwards. So if there are points of detail or you would like to talk to, with him about something privately, please just put it in and we'll make sure that he's able to contact you. Uh, second point is the slides will be available. In fact, I think they are available already on the website uh, for you to share. And this session is being recorded and the recording will be available in approximately two working days, i.e. Uh, sometime late Friday afternoon, I would hope, so that you can share with friends and colleagues. Well, that's me out of the way. Um, we do have a poll coming up, so do keep your hands on your buzzers. But right now, Sam, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, so, um, and thank you, thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'm not in control of my slides here, so I'm sort of gonna do my best to um, orally nudge them along at the appropriate time. Um, I should just say at the outset, Michael has previously taken me to task for using uh, insufficiently precise technical terminology when it comes to discussing cryptocurrencies. Um, I'm gonna try, I've tried to take that on board, but I'm going to apologize in advance for any slip-ups um, and very grateful if the heckling on that front could be saved until the end. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what is a crypto, crypto scam? Now, scam is quite an imprecise word for a lawyer. Um, I've chosen to interpret it as any one of a number of ways uh, that you could be defrauded on the blockchain, so to speak. Um, so I've got four different ones here. Um, investing in a non-existent blockchain or, or fake token. Um, APP or authorized push payment frauds. Uh, these are very common in sort of traditional bank accounts uh, where you're, you're socially groomed, you're called by a fraudster and they get you to use your own internet banking interface to send cash to another account. Well, that happens in cryptocurrencies as well or straight up thefts uh, out of a wallet. Um, ransomware attacks, which actually take a very similar uh, format to APP frauds um, in that the ransom is often paid in cryptocurrency. Um, and then finally, exchange hacks. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so dealing with them in order. Um, if you've listened to the BBC Sounds podcast, The Missing Crypto Queen, and if you haven't, I strongly recommend it, um, you might be familiar with OneCoin, um, which was sort of billed a number of years ago as the, the new cryptocurrency for the masses. And um, what uh, essentially allegedly happened um, is that thousands, if not tens of thousands of people poured their money into a non-existent, apparently, cryptocurrency. Um, there wasn't even a blockchain um, at the time. Um, I don't know if eventually there was one, 
but it, it all looks to have been a big old scam um, organized by some Eastern European mafia. Um, now, uh, if you could uh, just click on, yeah, so this actually isn't a crypto scam at all. Um, it's what I like to call as a MacGuffin, the crypto in the story. Now, if you've not come across MacGuffin before, uh, click click on please. Um, a MacGuffin is a literary device for something that is actually irrelevant to the plot of the story, um, but um, but but sort of nevertheless, the story is kind of formed around it. So when this hit the press, everyone was saying, oh, a big crypto scam. Well, it's not really anything to do with crypto at all. Um, it was, you know, just happened to be the tool that was being used to defraud people, um, again, allegedly. Um, so um, this slide in a way is just filler. So um, you can excuse me for that. But um, nevertheless, if this has happened to you, and it definitely has been happening, there's been quite a lot of press about it, um, you essentially have two options. Um, the first is to follow the money. So if you've been paying cash to a scammer to invest in a non-existent token, then you should have your own bank records, you should know where your cash went, you should have a bank account. And if you have a bank account, then you have a potential target for a court application um, and an injunction. Um, all sounds nice in theory, massive practical issues, it's going to be very expensive, um, it's probably going to involve um, tracing money to a foreign jurisdiction, um, but there are ways around that. Um, and if you have uh, been defrauded along with thousands of other people, then you know it might be worth pursuing a, a group claim or at least looking into it, um, share the, the risk and the cost. Um, all of that said, not for the faint of heart. Um, second option might be to look at your own bank. Um, there's something called a quince care duty, and I'm going to try and leave the legal jargon um, out as much as possible. Um, but if you need to speak to a lawyer, ask them if the uh, you know, that's something you can ask them and they'll be very impressed. Uh, am I owed a quince care duty? Um, that's essentially a situation where a bank is on notice that you as its customer um, might be uh, a victim of fraud or might be about to be a victim of fraud. And you would say, well, you should have stopped me from making this transfer. Um, so that's a possibility as well. And advantages to that are, you know, it's your bank, it has money, it can, it can, <laughs> it can um, recompense you. Um, but I, again, I'm not saying I'm not saying it's easy. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the actual um, interesting crypto scams and uh, leave behind the filler. Um, so number two and number three, I'm actually going to deal with together because they take the same shape, um, and that is where tokens move on the blockchain from an address that you control to one that you don't, um, and what you can do really depends on where they go. Um, so what happens with thefts on the blockchain is that uh, often they first go to an intermediary address. Um, that's often the first destination. Um, now, anyone with access to the relevant software can set up a, a sort of freestanding address on a, on a cryptocurrency blockchain outside of an exchange. It's just you can download the software and you can just do it and then you can send your tokens to that address. Now. Um, that isn't necessarily going to be good enough for someone who has defrauded you because they might want to cash out. And if it's just sitting there in perpetuity at that address, it's essentially useless. So what then often happens is at some point later, the thief will try and move that to an address um, which can be uh, linked to a public exchange, um, such as uh, Coinbase is a very well-known one. Um, Revolut offers uh, those services as well. Binance, again, very well-known. Um, these, are all, these are all household names these days. Um, and if you can identify, if you can figure out that one of these addresses is connected to an exchange, then what you can do is you can get in touch with the exchange and you can say, you're now holding the proceeds of crime, please can you freeze this um, address and also any addresses belonging to the same customer. Now, obviously, as I, I as the victim have no idea who the customer is yet, um, but all I'm saying to the exchange, and, they, and they, they're not going to tell me because they owe duties of confidentiality to their customer, um, but I can ask them to put a freeze. And in my experience, exchanges do often voluntarily freeze in the same way that banks do, um, freeze um, wallets um, where there are grounds to believe that there is, has been a fraud. Um, what you then need to do is rush off to court, um, get an injunction, um, get orders for disclosure, serve that on the, the exchange, and the exchange can then tell you. Um, who their customer is, 
may or may not be the thief or the fraudster. Um, um, and, and, you know, what other um, wallets or, or addresses uh, the same customer controls. Um, and that all then gets you in a much better position to try and get your tokens back. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things um, I like about cryptocurrency frauds um, and, and asset tracing exercises on the blockchain is that um, anyone can see a you know, primary evidence of a, of a, of a, a theft or a fraud um, by just using a blockchain explorer. Um, now, this is one of the first cases to, uh, to, to consider or to look at um, asset tracing on the Bitcoin blockchain is a case called Robertson and Persons Unknown. And what I've highlighted here from one of the publicly available blockchain explorers is the theft that took place. Uh, it was a spear phishing attack and 100 Bitcoin was taken out of his wallet um, and transferred to these addresses. And that's, you know, that's in a, a publicly available court order and you just type in the, the transaction hash ID and you can look at it just as anybody else in the world will, can look at it, um, which I think is pretty cool. Um, next slide, please. Um, and the same with exchange hacks. So this is the now infamous 2011 Mt. Gox hack where 80,000 Bitcoin um, was, was taken in a hack of that exchange. This is now worth 3 billion US dollars, the amount that was taken, 80,000 Bitcoin. Um, and again, that's just preserved there for all eternity. Anyone can go and look at that. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Um, now, next slide, please. Going back to the pictogram I showed you a few minutes ago, um, if you could click on, um, how do you get it back? Now, it's pretty easy with cash frozen in a bank account to get the cash back because if you go and get a court judgment that says this cash is yours, you can serve that on the bank and the bank will then pay it back to you because it's, it's in control of the accounts that are held with it. Whether or not you can do that with an exchange really depends on the technical setup of that exchange. Now, um, I'm sure the very erudite audience already knows this, but if you um, essentially, whoever has the, the control of the private key, which corresponds to the public key where the tokens are held, can transfer those tokens. Now, if the exchange is set up in a way that it doesn't actually have the private key and it's only the customer that does, then you might be stuffed because you might be forced to just look at your token sitting there on that um, uh, in that exchange at that address for, for perpetuity, unable to do anything about it. And if, if the, the thief, if the account holder at the exchange has scarpered, um, there's just nothing nothing really that you can do about it. So it, it may well depend exactly on how the, how the exchange is um, set up. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and click on, please. Um, another idea, if that does happen, um, would be to try to restore the blockchain itself. Um, now some of you might be familiar with a guy called Craig Wright, who is an Australian computer scientist and publicly claims to be the creator of Bitcoin, um, the pseudonymous Satoshi Nakamoto. Now, this is a, uh, a screenshot of a, a letter that was circulated around on the internet um, a, from his lawyers, um, where what he has sort of inventively tried to do is to launch a claim saying that he was the owner of Bitcoin stored at an address or certain addresses, two addresses here, um, and that he, uh, his computer, which was storing the private keys for those addresses, uh, was hacked. Um, the private keys were taken, um, erased from his computer, and there was no evidence of the hack. So he says, well, I'm the owner of these, of these Bitcoin um, at that address, um, only the person with the private keys can transfer that Bitcoin. Um, I don't have the private keys anymore, but I am nevertheless the owner. Um, someone needs to restore the blockchain uh, so that I can essentially have the value transfer, make use of the, the Bitcoin sort of that address. And what he's done is he has brought proceedings against some key players in the uh, Bitcoin blockchain uh, essentially alleging that he is owed a duty by all of them to put him in a position whereby he can do that again. Which, as I said, is inventive, 
um, if not a bit optimistic, um, in my opinion. Um, but it's early days and we will see where this case goes. Um, next slide, please. Um, exchange hacks. Now, this happens all the time. Um, it seems like barely a week goes by without some report of some exchange somewhere having been hacked for tens or hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, and I think quite interestingly, the position of the exchange's customer in terms of do they bear the loss or does the exchange bear the loss may really depend on the nature of the customer's relationship with the exchange. Um, can we move on to our poll? So um, if you have a digital wallet and you hold cryptocurrency in it, have you ever looked at the terms and conditions? Um, now I'm using the term exchange sort of fairly casually um, because you can hold a, a wallet with all sorts of software providers that don't uh, offer an exchange service, but I'm focusing on exchanges like, like Coinbase and Revolut was one other I mentioned, um, uh, because they're some of the most popular ones. So if you go ahead and vote. No, an overwhelming majority of people have said no, which doesn't surprise me in the slightest. The thing that I am surprised is that the 12% of people who said yes, I was expecting a 100% to say no. Um, so good for you, 12%. Good for you. Right. <laughs> um, so um, what I did yesterday, because um, I'm a bit sad, is I went digging um, through the terms and conditions for some of the more popular exchanges um, to see what they said about their customers, uh, th their relationship with their customers. Um, and I didn't spend a huge amount of time digging, but what I found was that the position varies um, quite dramatically um, in some cases. So what I've got on the left is the terms and conditions for Coinbase. Um, and just reading out the green highlighting, it says title to digital currency shall at all times remain with you and shall not transfer to any company in the Coinbase group. And then in red, you shall bear all risk of losses. Now, um, I'm not, pretending that this is going to be some sort of deep detailed legal analysis here but i think what coinbase is saying is the coins are yours they're not ours they never become ours we're simply providing you with a software interface um and if you lose them then that's entirely your problem um i also had a quick look at bitstamp's terms and conditions which i think try to put even more blue sky between um, themselves and the customer um but they're along the same lines um revolut however take a slightly different approach um, what they say is we will hold your cryptocurrencies on your behalf and you will have a right called a beneficial right to them. Now, to lawyers, um, beneficial right uh, starts to sound an awful lot like Revolut is holding them on trust for you. Um, and then in the second paragraph, the green highlighting, the cryptocurrency we buy for you is held in a virtual account that also holds cryptocurrencies for other Revolut customers. You will not have a separate cryptocurrency account. Now, to me, what that sounds like is that they are pooling the cryptocurrency for all of their customers in one big address or maybe multiple addresses. But the point is that they're pooled together. They're not segregated on a customer by customer basis. Um, it also sounds like Revolut is treating them as fungible assets like cash um, rather than um, belonging to each sort of individual um, customer. Now, these might all sound like sort of quite interesting legal distinctions of no interest to anybody, but I think um, that they may put the customer in a different position um, in the event of a hack, um, and generally, but in the event of a hack, that's what we're talking about, um, depending on what the terms and conditions say. Um, so I'm just going to summarize those on the next and final slide. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. Okay, um, so the first one, um, is pool tokens no trust now i didn't actually um in my brief look online didn't actually find any terms and conditions that uh set out this sort of relationship but i wouldn't be surprised if there is an exchange that has this sort of thing in its terms and conditions because it's essentially like a bank account um the money you might be surprised to, to learn that the money in your bank account isn't actually yours it's the banks um 
what what you have is uh, a debt in the equivalent amount that is owed to you by your bank, but it is the bank's money while it is in that, that account. Um, now, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there was an exchange that, that set up their own operations in a similar way where they said, well, the tokens that you store with us are ours and we just owe you essentially a debt denominated in cryptocurrency. Um, and as and when you call for that, we'll, we'll pay it out to you. Now, in that scenario, if there were a hack such that the exchange's um, assets, the remaining cryptocurrency, uh, was insufficient to satisfy the debts owed to their customers, then seemingly the exchange is insolvent um, and the, the customers all rank pari passu, uh, which is legal jargon for you're all up shit creek, but at least you're all up shit creek to the same extent. Um, now, click on, please. So, um, this I think probably describes what Revolut was getting at, um, which is where the tokens are all pooled together. You don't have an identifiable um, address. You can say the tokens at that address are mine. They're all grouped together, but Revolut is saying, um, but we hold a proportion of, of that pool on trust for you. Um, now, if there's a hack there, then um, because you have a beneficial interest you in, in the um, in the assets that were stolen, um, you may have a proprietary claim over the stolen assets. You may be able to, to trace them to the uh, along the blockchain to the to the thief, which is something that you wouldn't be able to do in the previous example. I um, mean, you might also have a claim against the exchange for breach of trust, um, essentially to make you whole. Um, and then the final category. Um, which is, I think, what Coinbase are getting at, um, is where all of the customers' tokens are segregated. Um, they are in different uh, different wallets. Um, you can point to an address and say the tokens at that address are mine. The tokens, sorry, the tokens at that address are, are Michael's. Um, and I think what that might produce is a totally different outcome, um, depending on whose tokens were stolen, because if your tokens were stolen, then we saw that red underlined highlighting from Coinbase saying that's your problem. But if it was a different customer's tokens that were stolen, then it's their problem and it's happy days for you. Um, so I think the sort of conclusion from this, and I'm going to say provisional conclusion because I didn't spend a huge amount of time looking at all of them in detail, but I, you know, from a brief bit of, uh, let's call it research, um, we found some quite interesting differences. So um, if you are worried about a hack, um, it may be worth taking a quick look at your terms and conditions, or even better, just giving me a call um, and I'll turn my timer on. Um, and um, that is pretty much it, um, a minute early. Sam, that is absolutely fantastic. Um, so uh, I can see the audience out there pondering. Uh, do, do send in your questions, comments, and observations. Uh, but a few points really to kick off, Sam. Um, I mean, the points of law are all fascinating, but the individual is normally far more concerned with, you know, am I going to recover it or not? Um, do, do you have any tales of recovery? Yeah, sure. I mean, it does it does happen. Um, I think one of the um, advantages to cryptocurrencies being a, a relatively novel industry is that the uh, you know, the, the, the kind of light side of the industry, there is obviously a dark side of the industry, but the, the reputable exchanges are all vying to be taken seriously by the business world. And that is a good thing for people in our position because it means that they are um, amenable to complying with, well, I mean, they have to comply with the law, but it, it, it means that they, they're, they're amenable to sort of helping people. And you do get different experiences depending on which exchange you go to. I'm not gonna mention any names, but um, in my experience of um, fraud with bank accounts, you can send all of the letters to you that you want to your high street bank or to, to, the, to the recipient's high street bank saying, I've been defrauded, the money's ended up at your bank, can you please freeze this account? And you just will never hear anything, unless you go off and get a court order and that's all very expensive. Um, and, and they won't tell you whether the account's been frozen and you won't be able to sleep at night. Whereas with um, cryptocurrency exchanges, um, I found, again, it's a broader spectrum, but at least with some of them, they will put on a, a voluntary freeze. They will say, well, you haven't gone off to court, but, um, 
you know, I can see that you've got a viable, you know, claim for for, um, for for fraud here, and that these might be yours. So I'm going to freeze these until we can sort it out. And um, you know, that's incredibly valuable because the the old adage about possession being nine tenths of the law is not wrong. Um, if if you've got the assets, then that's almost more important than knowing who took them. Mm. Um, and, and yes, and, and, and that does happen. It does happen. Sorry, my light's gone off on a timer here, so I'm sort of sitting in the dark. But um, but yes, I mean, you, you do you you do um, you do hear stories, and you, people are successful in in recovering them. And uh, you know, the opposite happens as well. Um, sometimes you do end up in that situation, like I said, where you've been the victim of a a very uh, valuable fraud. And the assets are just sitting at some address that you can't identify on the blockchain, seemingly forever, um, which I imagine would be pretty heartbreaking. Um, but but yeah, I mean, you, there are successes. I mean, I mean, this is an important bit. I mean, the, the, there are tons of sites out there rating and looking at how to speculate in this betting market. Um, but are, are there any good sites with that kind of feedback about? you know, customer service and honest dealing that you might recommend? Anything out there where people can go and see which exchanges are really giving the customer service or, or even those just suspect? That's a really good question. I mean, for, so from my perspective, it wouldn't actually be customer service because customer service is sort of the opposite of what we want. Because if they're providing a good customer to their service, sorry, a good service to their customer and their customer is the crook who took it, then what we actually want them to be doing is complying with their legal obligations. So more important than customer service is, well, two things. Um, prevention is better than the cure. So um, having good security, um, having apps that allow you to have good security. So I, I was fiddling around with, um, with the, the Coinbase app last night and you can turn on biometric security, but you don't have to have it. And if you compare that to your say i don't know nat west banking app where you have to go through a laborious process to, to open it uh, the first time and then the second time until you turn on biometric security you know the banks the good thing about traditional banking apps is that they they they, they drag you kicking and screaming through an irritating series of you know customer user ids and dual factor authentication but it's there for you whereas with some of the crypto exchange apps, they don't force you to do that. And the security is only as good as your, you know, uh, tolerance for being annoyed by uh, user IDs and passwords. Um, and you, you can turn on biometric security, but it doesn't force you to. So I think if you're in this space, if you're holding tokens, then you need to force yourself to be better than your natural instinct would suggest when it comes to security. Mm -hmm. Same goes on the exchanges side. They need to be practicing the absolute best security. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say is, and this is probably going to be invisible um, to, to most consumers, but how good is their legal department? Um, and in a way, um, it doesn't really matter if your exchange has a good legal department. What you want is the exchange where the tokens have ended up to have a good legal department. And that's you know you can't predict that that's just you know good luck um so so yeah i mean like i said the thing to focus on would be would be prevention and if if you're the kind of person who gets annoyed by typing in your password and then do it using uh two-factor authentication well it it's there for a reason um and i would strongly strongly urge you to swallow the annoyance okay I mean, there's a bit of a paradox here, in a way. You pointed it out, I think, in your slide where you were, the last slide where you're looking at, you know, the customer's position depends, um, you know, very much on the exchange's terms and conditions. And in the middle, you had uh, the Revolut example of pool tokens and trust. But the whole idea behind the darn coins was that you had your coins directly with no interference at all. Uh, John Kenny is uh, typing in furiously here. Thank you, John. Uh, that he says, you know, the code is the trust and customer service uh, isn't really evident for the big cryptos as they base it on being a trustless system. So there's a sort of an odd circle here that I, I, I want the services of an exchange or a, a Revolut uh, payment wallet provider. But on the other hand, I 
equally um, don't want to trust anyone. And any comment on that? Yeah. So I mean, I think this is this is sort of a, a result of um, of cryptocurrencies entering the mainstream, in that um, when it was the sole purview of computer geeks who were happy to download their own wallet software and exchange tokens off exchange then that was fine and you didn't need any of that sort of relationship because you were only responsible for your own activities um, but when you want to outsource all of that stuff and you can't be bothered to figure it out for yourself um, and it's convenient to have a nice app you can take anywhere um, then um, then then you end up in these relationships with third parties like um, like you know the exchange some of the exchanges we've been looking at um, and um, I mean trust is a sort of funny word because it, it does have a, a, a specific legal meaning um, that uh, it, it doesn't you know it, 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 it does mean that you you know you trust someone but it means more than that I mean it, in the same way that um, when uh, you know you you, you have an elderly relative who dies and you're going through probate, then the, 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 your inheritance is held on trust for you. And all, all that really means is that whoever, whoever now owns the legal title owes you an obligation to not to sort of misuse the assets and to bequeath them to you um, when the time comes. And, and that, that's essentially, um, it's a concept very well known to the law, um, but, but that is um, the, it looks to be the sort of situation that, that, that Revolut has um, arranged with its customers, and it's it's certainly not the only one. There are there are others out there that, for whatever reason, it's just it's convenient for them to to pool their assets and um, give customers a sort of beneficial interest, um, which you know kind of makes you feel. I, I get I guess maybe for people who are sort of new to it feel sort of safe because they're kind of only dipping their toes in the water of cryptocurrency, but they're not really responsible for the security of their own address. I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, this may be a bit out of your bailiwick, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Barry Latin is curious. Uh, where are the general fault lines in crypto systems that cause these hacks to happen? Surely they are built robustly. So it is human error within the exchanges or is it by customers or, or is it something else? Um, so I, that it, 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 as you say, it is slightly outside my bailiwick. I'm going to talk um, from the experience of an analogy, which would be ransomware attacks um, and and other sorts of um, uh, other sorts of attacks. Um, now, I think it was reported last year. I was reading that 2021 was a a, a bumper year for what are called zero day attacks. Uh, now, a zero-day attack is a, an attack that uses a previously unknown exploit. So that will be just some, some, you know, gap in the code somewhere of some piece of software. And obviously, there are hundreds of pieces of software on, on modern computers that we, we use every day. Previously unknown exploit that hasn't been detected and hasn't been patched yet. And um, and, and it was the, a record year for that. Um, now, what that means to me is that um, the hackers are getting better and better at spotting new uh, exploits. And it also means that people are getting better at patching existing exploits that have been detected by Microsoft or Apple. Um, people know that they need to update their software now and they, they shouldn't just click maybe later or remind me tomorrow or whatever. They know that there's a good reason for doing that, but it isn't necessarily enough because um, there will still be, you know, exploits in imperfect pieces of software, and um, I imagine that, um, you know, that's that's what happens with with exchanges as well. Um, you know, it's it, it's ultimately human error in two respects. One, the code is imperfect, um, and number two, um, in all cases that I know of when a ransomware attack happens, it's because someone on the inside of the organization has clicked on something that they shouldn't have done. But, you know, these attacks are very sophisticated um, and they're very credible. And I, I like I say, I, I don't know, it's not totally within my area of expertise how the actual exchanges are hacked, but I imagine it's very similar. Um, and it could be just something as simple as, you know, an email that looks like it's come from Microsoft saying, you know, um, 
uh, I don't know, you need to update some software, click on this link, or it could be from someone masquerading as your as your PA um, or someone else from in your organization. That's how these things um, usually work. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's what was going on with exchanges as well. Now, you know, a burglar comes into my flat and steals something. I, I don't call my lawyer. I call the police. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not the first thing I'm thinking of anyway. Um, so the authorities do have a relationship here. And, you know, uh, you, you spoke about the one coin. Um, uh, John Kenny points out uh, squid games and crypto eats. Uh, you know, these, these frauds are, are coming up. Um, and we, we in fact, had, had a, an interesting uh, series years ago with a company called Doscoin, which just quietly folded its tent and disappeared, unable to be found anywhere, leaving quite a few of us out of pocket for expenses. Um, anyway, leave, leaving all those things to one side, uh, what's, what is the relationship like with the authorities and why, why should I go to my lawyer and not go to the authorities? Yeah, I mean... Um... So if you are the victim of fraud um, over here uh, in this jurisdiction, then, um, and, and you, you go to the criminal authorities, then you will be rede redirected in every case to action fraud, which is uh, basically an, an internet, I mean, I imagine people work for it as well, but it's a, it's, a, it's a website and you fill in some details, you explain what happened. Um, you probably receive a confirmation email and then in my experience, you nothing else happens you you never receive anything else um no follow-up um certainly no compensation no witness interview nothing like that um and my suspicion is that um the criminal authorities over here have a very constrained budget um they go after really big ticket stuff um because that's where the payoff is um, but for little old you and me who has been defrauded out of the deposit for our house on our completion date because the solicitor's email accounts got hacked and we accidentally sent it to a fraudster, they just don't have the resources to deal with with um, with that sort of thing. And you know the 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 amount of fraud going on like it is just legion. They they can't keep up. Um, there are jurisdictions we were chatting before before this started. There are jurisdictions where the police really do help. Um, one such is Hong Kong. So if you happen to live in Hong Kong and you have been defrauded, um, then the police can be very proactive and can have very good powers. And I think also randomly Portugal um, is another example. Um, but and there and there may well be others. But um, the uh, here the you know um, commercial lawyers can spring into action overnight um, and rush off to court. Um, very quickly to get a get a, a freezing order. Um, very serious stuff. Um, people who knowingly uh, violate freezing orders can be put in prison. Um, so the, the the courts here, the civil courts here, do have very serious powers. The only problem is that you obviously have to have to pay for it, whereas you don't with the police. Um, so uh, if you've just been robbed of your life savings, then that's probably not going to be much help to you. Okay. Um we did have a, a number of um, hacks over the years where uh, the monies were recovered. Um, and I, I mean, I think, you know, a good example might be Mount Gox, where some of the monies were recovered. Um, how are those then distributed? Yeah, I was, um, funny enough, there was one the other day, if you just excuse me for a second, I'm just going to do a very quick bit of um, Googling. Um, so yeah, yeah um, do so, authorities take a portion for their efforts? Do they take a, are they on some kind of percentage game and then it's spread in proportion to the accounts? I can give you a very good example. Um, so there was a hack on Bitfinex, which was um, recovered um, $3.6 billion recovered um, only about a month ago, I think by the authorities. And what they did was that they issued a new token to um, customers who had been affected by the hack, um, which gave them a right to sort of exchange, and, and they had a right to exchange that token if the proceeds of the hack were ever recovered. Um, so I, I, I don't know the detail, but that's sort of essentially what they did. Now, um, I would guess, I mean, I, I, unless the terms and conditions say this, I don't think an exchange would have a right to impose that on you. 
So if you were a customer and you weren't happy with that proposal, that's essentially a settlement proposal. If you weren't happy with it, then you could reject it and you could you could look at claims against the exchange if you wanted to. Um, but equally, a savvy exchange might be looking at baking something like that into their terms and conditions these days, saying, you know, in the event of loss, then we have the right to compensate you with a token which will be redeemable when we recover it. Um, so that might be something to look out for as well if you weren't satisfied or going to be satisfied with, with that compensation. Uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to make fun of lawyers, um, and you need to make a living, <laughs> so I, I get it too. Points you have to turn the meter on. Um, <laughs> one of our guests here lost uh, lost assets to Cryptopia, thinking it was safe in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, so I walk in, lost some assets in Cryptopia. Uh, when do you turn the the meter on? And then I sort of say, okay, okay, I'm happy to commission you, but this is all international stuff, and you know. The, the legal system's expensive as it is, and the minute you touch international, it goes off the charts. What are your thoughts on that? Well, so one thing I would say, uh, so the, the Cryptopia uh, judgment is actually very well known in legal circles as one of the first judgments in the common law world to examine whether or not uh, crypto assets can be held on trust. Um, so very familiar with the Cryptopia situation. Um, what I would say is that uh, Cryptopia is New Zealand. Um, you can always go and speak to a, a, a New Zealand lawyer. Um, they have a you know, legal system that looks very similar to ours. Um, it's all very, very accessible. Um, and um, that, that is definitely a viable option. Um, probably more worthwhile doing that than speaking to an English lawyer because we're in, a wrong, in the wrong jurisdiction. Um, so, so, so it, always a good idea to figure out where the exchange actually is and then go and speak to the lawyers in that jurisdiction because they're going to be able to do more for you. Um, and then the other thing I, I would say is um, I had a similar thing. It wasn't a hack, but it was a sort of, um, again, a sort of industry-wide event which um, left a lot of customers of this particular exchange out of pocket, is that they looked up grouping, up, grouping together. Um, and um, what that can obviously do is it can share the burden of the costs um, and it can be much easier to, if you've all got the same claim, um, it can essentially be commoditized as a claim um, and you're, you're not paying as much. Um, and if you've got a big enough claim um, and it looks like there might be some prospect of recovering it, then you may potentially be able to get um, third party litigation funding which is where someone else pays the legal bills um, in exchange for a, a cut of the recoveries. Um, so, you know, it's not the end of the line. Um, I'm not going to pretend it's not difficult um, and that there aren't uncertainties. Obviously, there are, um, but uh, there are, uh, you know, there, there, there are things that you can look at doing. And again, um, you know, that, that sort of reminds me of another bit of really good advice, which would be that in addition to looking at the terms and conditions, think about where you're exchange is based. Um, if it's in a reputable jurisdiction like England, like New Zealand, uh, Hong Kong is another one, then um, then, then that's great. Um, uh, probably won't be based in Hong Kong actually due to um, the PRC's relationship with cryptocurrency at the moment, um, but you see where I'm going with this. Uh, figure out where it's based. Um, if it looks to be somewhere that you would only ever visit once on holiday, um, somewhere in the middle of the Pacific, maybe don't choose that exchange. Um, and, um, but if, if it's not, then, um, then that's probably a better bet. Hmm. Well, uh, sadly, we've come to the end of time, um, and uh, I need to wrap up with uh, some quick thanks. Uh, firstly, to our sponsors. I know that many of us are involved in markets where we know that there are dark sides to those markets, so we appreciate you letting us explore those from time to time, because it's uh, just as important for all of us to police those markets if we want markets to work. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank you, the audience, uh, very vibrant out there, um, and, and a lot of comments there. In fact, a couple I think uh, I, I might pick up on uh, for future uh, webinars. I hadn't appreciated the interest in this. Um, Sam, if I may, to you, uh, you are you know, a very considerate, erudite, and thoughtful uh, lawyer, and I was delighted that you uh, came on today to chat about it. Uh, you know, for me, I think there are a number of things here. John Kenny points out that a lot of the stuff's about social engineering. You know, I put into the chat room, sometimes we forget this, but over 60% of the coins issued have been out and out scams, full stop. So that's before you get into the, the situation of is the coin that you're in having problems. And then 
you focused on an existing structured coin system, whereas quite a few of the scams have actually been in what has effectively been the ICO, as the, the coins just never traded. And there's a Boston College study on it, one we did with uh, Ian Dowson and William Garrity Associates a few years back. And they now have something like 10,000 coins issued. Uh, of course, then once you're in there, practically uh, you need to you know have a wallet and you probably want an exchange and and that's where the system starts to break down in some some ways but you're absolutely correct folks read your tnc's <laughs> that was one piece of advice turn on your two factor authentication and realize that uh, all the advantages you thought with this equally come with a bit of downside so sam if i may i'm going to use uh, something on our international front we unable to give you proper English applause. Uh, we're going to go international on our scam and I'm going to scam you uh, with some <laughs> with some Korean karmic clapping. Uh, but if I could have opened up everything, the audience I know would be applauding loudly. Really appreciate you coming today and sharing your knowledge. And hopefully, uh, as this evolves, maybe you can give us uh, a few peeks at some of the other darker corners of this world. Well, thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed it.